Good morning. Good morning. Today, of course, is Valentine's Day weekend, so happy day after Valentine's Day, all you celebrants. And I'm glad to see so many of you still made it into church this morning. Well done. And also, happy International Darwin Day. As I'm sure you all know, February 12th was the birthday of one Charles Darwin, father of evolutionary theory, and surely in the running for one of the most important thinkers of all time. So in his honor, we celebrate the 10th annual Evolution Sunday weekend. This is a weekend set aside at this time every year in which congregations of all faiths are encouraged to have a discussion about the relationship between religion and science. Evolution Sunday is an outgrowth of the Clergy Letter Project in which almost 14,000 U.S. clergy, including 285 UU ministers, have now signed some variation of a letter that affirms the theory of evolution <coughs> and supports the teaching of evolution in public schools. And the Clergy Letter Project is still needed today because no matter how many times the courts smack them down, uh, efforts to force religion and junk science into public school science classes keep sprouting back up like the most tedious game of whack-a-mole ever in <laughs> And unfortunately, the latest effort here in Indiana is Senate Bill 562, introduced by Senator Jeff Rabs and Senator Dennis Cruz. Senator Cruz has kind of an unfortunate history with this issue already. In 2012, he passed a bill out of our Senate that would have required teaching alternative theories to evolution, intelligent design, creationism, etc., again, in science classrooms. And that bill never made it through the House, uh, to our credit. This new bill, uh, 562, doesn't mention evolution by name, and it's sort of carefully couched to appear to be very harmless. It protects the rights of science teachers to help students critique uh, scientific weaknesses in controversial scientific theories. <laughs> and who could be opposed to critical thoughts? Right? I mean, so this, this new approach to undermining the teaching of evolution was actually cooked up by some, an institution called the Discovery Institute, which advocates for intelligent design, which again, whatever you think about that, uh, they advocated for it to be taught in science classrooms. And what the bill exists to do is to protect the ability of teachers to present topics like evolution or climate change as though they're very controversial when in fact there's overwhelming scientific consensus as, as to how they operate. So if you are so inclined, you may want to call or write your state representative and share your thoughts about Senate Bill 562. But my desire to celebrate Evolution Sunday at UUI every year is about more than just keeping an eye on the anti-science shenanigans going on in our state. And it goes beyond fostering a conversation between science and religion, the ostensible purpose of Evolution Sunday weekend. Because Unitarian Universalism is unambiguous in its assertion that the scientific understanding of the world should inform our religious understanding of the world. So that would be a very short conversation in a UU church. You know? Science, religion, yes, yes, good. Okay, done, go on. <laughs> our Unitarian Universalist principles and sources specifically counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science in our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. So whatever personal beliefs we bring to the practice of Unitarian Universalism, we are asked and encouraged to be willing to test them against the scientific understanding of natural history, i.e. evolution. This is not incompatible with our theological diversity as a religious group, and of course we have great theological diversity represented in Unitarian Universalism. There's a famous story about Joseph Lagrange, the 19th century French mathematician and physicist. He had just finished writing his kind of grand masterpiece. It was called Celestial Mechanics. And it was this summary that incorporated all the new scientific understanding of how the cosmos works. And he found himself in an audience with the Emperor Napoleon. Because Napoleon, when he was not in the business of creating widows and orphans, fancied himself quite the man of science. And he said to Lagrange, 
I have read your book with great interest, but I noticed that nowhere in the book do you mention God. And Lagrange replied, Sir, I had no need of that hypothesis. <laughs> and as far as belief in God goes, that's all that evolution says. You know, it doesn't rule out belief in God. It only says we do not need to invoke a God or gods or some unknown force to explain the natural history of life on Earth doesn't conflict with belief in God, it just says we don't need that hypothesis. But setting aside the question of God, I'd like to talk about evolution in church, because I think an understanding of evolution can powerfully inform our religious life as Unitarian Universalists. Unitarian Universalism as a religion is very concerned with relationships, with our relationship to one another and our relationship with the natural world. Our seventh principle is respect for the interdependent web of life of which we are all a part. And the theory of evolution speaks to that interdependent web. And it says two things about it. First it says that all living things are related to one another through descent from a distant common ancestor. That's the fact of evolution, that it happens. Secondly, it says that the diversity of all the living things that we see around us is kind of an enormous treasure trove of life on Earth. It, can all, it was all generated by the same process, natural selection applied to naturally occurring random variation. That's the process of evolution. That's the how it happened. And those two ideas together, the fact that it happened, the how that it happened, they paint a particular picture of the web of life and place in it, and it's very different than the picture that came before. So for me, evolution properly understood leads me to experience the world with deeper humility and reverence and gratitude. Now, prior to Darwin, our Western understanding of humanity's relationship to the rest of the natural world could be described by what Aristotle called the Great Ladder of Being the great ladder of being, which was an internal hierarchy of all living things, really unliving and living things, arranged in a progression from lower to higher. Right? You've got the bottom, you've got like dirt and rocks and unliving things, and then you've got plants, because at least they're alive, they can't do much, but they're alive, and then higher up you've got animals, which can do things, and then at the very top you've got capital M, man, because man is the rational animal. And that is the order of lower to higher living things. Now the Christians took that Greek concept, Thomas Aquinas, took the same basic idea, and then he kind of layered on top of that all these choirs of angels, if you're anyone's familiar with that, like cherubim, seraphim, etc., above humans reaching on up to God. But it was the same basic idea, that there's a ladder being stretching from a savage animal up through humans on into the heavens. Lower to higher, where higher equals better. And what a lot of people want to do is take the idea of evolution and superimpose it on top of that ladder of being. Only now it kind of reads from left to right. And you've probably seen the pictures, right? You've got kind of like a, a weird tadpole thing, a fish thing, and then maybe a mammal, and then a monkey, and then hominids, and then humans at the right, and we kind of progressing towards the human being, right? the culmination of evolutionary history. <clears throat> we somehow retain the idea of lower creatures and higher creatures, or primitive creatures and more advanced creatures, and of course, we are always still on top. For example, let's take a question that you frequently hear in creationist literature, or sadly from one of my daughter's sixth grade teachers. <laughs> if humans evolve from monkeys, why are monkeys still around? Now this is an honest question, but it comes from a misunderstanding of how evolution works. What evolution actually says is, at one point in the past, monkeys and humans had a common ancestor. So there was an animal that was not a monkey, and was also not human. And one group of this animal's ancestors evolved into monkeys, exploring the monkey way of being in the world. And another group evolved into humans, exploring the human way of being in the world. 
so that evolution doesn't look like a ladder at all. It's not a steady progression of lower to higher. It's more like this crazy branching bush where things keep splitting off and splitting off and splitting off. All of these different life forms finding their own unique way of making a living in the world, following their different trajectories. And what we humans like to do, viewing ourselves as kind of the natural center of creation, lords of the universe, we look at this enormous branching bush that's billions of years old, and in fact we're a tiny green tip on the furthest shoot of one branch, and we circle that branch and we go, well there it is. That's clearly the most important part of that bush, right? So monkeys did not turn into humans. And humans are not an improved monkey. We're not monkey 2.0. <laughs> and when we understand evolution as this branching tree of life and not as a ladder, we see that becoming a monkey was as equally a satisfying answer to life's challenge as becoming a human. And understood that way, everything alive is as equally awesome an answer to the problem of making a living in the world as happening to have become a human. In fact, humans are Johnny-come-latelys to the game of life. Turtles have been around for about 200 million years, in the same form roughly as they are now. Talk about a successful design solution. Humans in our modern form have been around for about 200,000 years, so a thousand times less than turtles. We've been around for less than 0.005% of the Earth's history, which is uncomfortably close to 0% of the Earth's history. And one of the things about being so young as a species is that we lift out of the interconnected web of life that much more easily. The living things that evolved earlier than us had much more of an opportunity to kind of enmesh themselves in interconnectedness. Think about funguses for a second, fungi. They came into the world way before we did, and that gave them a chance to grab a really primo role life. So fungi, along with bacteria, are responsible for breaking down all the dead organic matter in the biosphere. All the stuff that us living things are made of, right? Carbon and nitrogen and etc. There's only so much of these building blocks available in nature. There's only so much to go around. And if it weren't for fungi and bacteria, dead bodies wouldn't decompose. They just like stack up all over the landscape, right? you know, like obstructing bike lanes and just getting in the way. And pretty soon we'd be out of the raw materials which we need to make more living things. So, because decomposition releases those raw materials back into life, fungi recycle life. They're the Environmental Sustainability Committee of the Biosphere. Literally, there could be no new life without them. So I submit that nothing we humans currently do, or possibly will ever do, could be that useful, that much of a blessing to life and our fellow creatures as what the fun they do. And we give them practically nothing in return. Right? A little snack after we're done using our bodies. <laughs> when it comes to our place in the interconnected web of life, we need it far more than it needs us. When you get home, Find that black mold colony in your bathroom, give it a little hug. <laughs> <laughs> so when humans fancy themselves at the top of the great chain of being as lords of creation, given dominion over the world, each new revelation of life's natural wonders was like another feather in our cap, right? One more thing for us to lord over. But in the light of evolution, an investigation of the natural world humbles us a little bit. It should provoke a little humility. There's a story, perhaps apocryphal, that the biologist uh, J.B.S. Haldane was asked by religious thinkers, tell us what a study of God's creation could reveal to us about the mind of the Creator. And Haldane responded, he seems to be rather inordinately fond of beetles. Because after all, there are 300,000 species of beetles and one species of people. So humility, but 
Evolution also deepens my sense of wonder and reverence. I recently learned about an amazing animal called the tardigrade, also known as the water bear. And tardigrades are microscopic animals that grow to about half a millimeter as adults, so you can see them like in a low power microscope. They mostly live in water and they feed on lichen and mosses. They're shaped kind of like a segmented beanbag chair with like eight stubby little legs. And they live all over the world. There's 1,500 species of them. They live from the Himalayas to the polar regions. There are billions of tardigrades on planet Earth. And the interesting thing about tardigrades is that they're practically indestructible. You can drop a tardigrade in boiling water, no problem. You can freeze it to one degree above absolute zero, it will be fine. You can crush it with pressure six times what's found at the bottom of the deepest ocean trench. It will bounce right back. You can blast it with radiation levels a thousand times higher than what would kill other animals. It has some kind of fast repairing DNA that protects it. You can dry it out to a husk and put it on a shelf for 10 years. Just add water, the tardigrade will spring back to life. You can even subject the tardigrade to the merciless vacuum of space, and it will survive, for a while anyway. So taking a page from Haldane, we could say that evolution appears to be inordinately fond of tardigrades. <laughs> At least it is determined that the tardigrade shall endure. Meanwhile, the poor human can easily die just from falling out of a tree, and not a very tall tree at that, <laughs> which I've always been a little sore about because didn't our ancestors live in trees? Yeah. Should have better this. <laughs> so on the one hand, this is humbling, but on the other hand, this is thrilling because who wouldn't want a relative like the tardigrade, right? We're related. The theory of evolution says we are all of us the result of the continuous unfolding of the same billions year old process. And what a process it is. Teeming, surging, churning, endlessly creative. It is life itself and we're right in the thick of it. We're not apart from the story of life. We're not separate from it, above it, or below it. With apologies to Dylan Thomas, the same force that makes the tardigrade invincible shaped my opposable thumb. When we step outside, we're confronted with the cornucopia of life, even in suburbia, despite our very best efforts. Grasses and plants carpeting the earth, insects running over and through every inch of it, small mammals scurrying away, birds soaring above, the whole invisible universe of spores and microbes and bacteria saturating the air and soil and water, canines everywhere taking their bipeds for their daily exercise, <laughs> And the same ancient song is singing in all of us, in all of us. And so knowing that we are all kin, all birthed out of the same wonderful process, makes me feel personally connected and grounded and more deeply re re reverent, excuse me, more deeply reverent for all living things. And finally, the story of evolution fills me with gratitude. Because of all the amazing things about the experience of life, to me the most amazing is that we experience it at all. Because it doesn't seem like a given that awareness had to evolve at all. In the sense of conscious experience, awareness in the sense of conscious experience. Much of nature gets along just fine without it today. And certainly the first billion or years or so of the history of life didn't involve any kind of awareness. Just single-celled organisms kind of motoring about, no more conscious than a Roomba. It doesn't seem like a given that awareness had to evolve at all. But at some point in the history of life, the universe woke up. It woke up to itself and began to know itself, to experience itself, not just to gather data, to gather information, like a single photoreceptor cell responding mechanically to the presence of light, it began to see, to experience the richness of color, to hear birdsong, to taste nectar. This is the mystery of mysteries to me. 
that it is in the nature of the material universe, all of these protons and electrons whizzing around in space, if you organize them the right way by evolution, they wake up. And we humans are privileged then to be part of this most sacred thing, the universe discovering itself, delighting in itself, ultimately loving itself, because love is also a product of evolution. Was all this inevitable from the moment the universe sprang into existence? Is it all a stupefyingly unlikely accident of history? However it is that we come to be alive, come to be aware, come to experience the universe in all its mystery, and come to love one another, I am profoundly grateful for this opportunity to be a part of the ride, profoundly grateful to be a sustaining note for however brief a moment in this most ancient song. And we come here to share that gratitude with one another. May it be so, and bless it be. Would you please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn number 1064, <clears throat>